Breaking news. Breaking news. It's the year of the chatbot. The latest setback for climate action. The latest Supreme Court, the court ruling. Is set In to the redefine. latest Supreme Court ruling, the court is set to redefine. Hi there, and welcome to the Mission Forward podcast. I'm Carrie Fox, your host and CEO of Mission Partners, a social impact communications firm and certified B Corporation. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. You're catching us early into season nine, and this is guaranteed to be a great conversation, in part because of how well this conversation today aligns with our inaugural episode from this season with the brilliant Carol Cohn. Now, in case you missed it, just a couple weeks back, we had Carol Cohn on the show to help us set the scene for the year ahead. We talked about the unlimited potential of purpose in this consequential year, and she gave us a couple of those Carol Cohn deep breaths to help us make sense of the headlines too. Today's conversation is gonna give you even more insights to power your work in the year ahead. That's because I'm delighted to have with us today, Lawrence Evans, CEO of Reputation Leaders and a global thought leader in how to positively build trust and reputation. And Lawrence and I are both members of Carol's Purpose Collaborative, and I am always struck by how many incredible insights he has right at his fingertips. No surprise though, Lawrence is go-to counsel for C-suite executives around the world. His insights have informed reputation strategies for clients such as Unilever, Toyota, PepsiCo, PayPal, and Shabani. Today, he's gonna share with us some new research about how CEOs are feeling in this year, and we'll work to understand what those feelings mean for your own actions in the year ahead. Lawrence, it is wonderful to have you here on Mission Forward. Carrie, it's wonderful to be here, and uh, Carol is a good friend of both of ours, and I'm uh, I'm delighted to be having this conversation. I think it's very timely. It sure is. We're going to start at the beginning, the way we like to do here at Mission Forward. I've given folks the the big picture view of who you are, but now let's actually learn a little more about who you are. Tell us about how you got into this work, what brings you to purpose work, and wherever you want to start, we're ready to listen. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm a New Zealander, uh, currently living in the UK, but have lived in the US and have uh, lived in four continents, moved 22 times, and done business in 50 countries around the world. So Ooh. a bit of a, a global traveler. Um and I guess my, my journey probably started pretty early. My father always encouraged us uh, to leave the world a better place than we found it. And that, that impetus to make a difference, I think, and through his example, he was mayor of our city for nine years. And I saw the difference that he made in the community. And I think that inspired me. I had the opportunity in 2007 to join Edelman as the global head of research in a company called Strategy One, which was an amazing opportunity and ran the trust barometer then for seven years. But there were a couple of early projects that we did that really just changed my mind about the importance of combining brand purpose and social purpose mm -hmm. together. And the first, which is probably well known to you, was the original Dove report on real beauty, self-esteem. And uh, that was done by Strategy One back in 2004. And the key insight there was only 2% of women in the world would describe themselves as beautiful. It was shocking. Mm. But it was a real pushback against what in those days and still is, this very catwalk, very advertising-driven view about beauty. And it was a real call to democratize beauty, to redefine it, and to particularly to redefine uh, the image uh, that young women had of themselves. So from that, really, I got involved in the Dove uh helping the Dove brand as part of Unilever. And they launched, of course, a fantastic piece of, of thought leadership in the Dove self-esteem beauty campaign. You know, it will train quarter of a million young people on self-positive body image by the year 2030. So it's, it's a good example of how thought leadership has continued to change lives, but it's also um, enabled Dove to change from being a soap bar to a beauty bar. And then I did a number of other projects like that. I was on the the brand board for Dirt is Good for a couple of years. And Dirt is Good, again, the key insight there was we we did a global study and we found out that 90% of kids had had a television, spent a lot of time in front of television, but only about 30% of those ever spent a lot of time outdoors in nature. And the aha moment from that is is 
there's a generation growing up who has no connection to the outdoors, no connection to the environment. And unless they do, unless they can get their fingernails dirty and they can see frogs and climb trees and others, they're never going to care about, about nature. And so instead of thinking of dirt as bad, why don't we think about dirt as good? And make it a positive thing that kids should go out and get dirty and they should play and, and there's no trouble to wash their clothes. So it was a brilliant example mm. of a brand taking a social purpose and using it for something that was aligned to their brand. I think for me that the aha moment was there doesn't have to be a trade-off. You can make money and do good. You can mm. pursue something that has a purpose, but also make it good for your brand. And so in light of that and the work I was doing, the trust barometer, the quest became, well, how can we help more companies do that find something that's really true to their brand pers- purpose but also has a really strong social purpose as well right so lawrence i am realizing here that your superpower is truly seeing things that many people don't see <laughs> you come across these amazing ahas that my goodness as a woman i thank you and as a parent of two girls who like to play in the dirt i thank you but the the ability to listen so deeply and then make sense of the data truly is is you and your team superpower. Uh, it is. I mean, we we have a fantastic team. We have eight staff from six countries who speak seven languages. Hmm. So I like to say that Reputation Leaders is a is a place where the curious come to work. Oh, I love that. But I I do think it's true. I do think I deliberately hire people who love to travel, who enjoy culture, who speak languages, because you're looking for people who are fundamentally just interested in the world and are interesting people. And when you get a group of people like that and you get the chance to work with some great clients, then, then insights happen because people bring different views. You have different perspectives. Um, Yes. Research is, is one tool to getting to those insights, but the insights come from the people you bring together. Let's talk about you as a business owner yourself before we look at the data. When did you decide that you were going to break out and build your own firm or why? Uh, so about a decade ago, in 2013, I started Reputation Leaders. I'd worked on the Trust Barometer with Edelman. I'd seen the power of taking global thought leadership to a place like Davos and really making a difference. Um, I wanted to do that for other companies. I think that trust is really important, um, but trust in many cases is an outcome of building a good reputation over many years. And there's more things to a re- reputation than purely trust. Mm. And our model of reputation says you've got to, it, you've got to have a great brand. That's absolutely true, but you've also got to be um, orientated towards the people and planet. You've got to do the right mm. thing for people, and you've got to do the right thing for the planet. And that's not optional. All three of those have to come together, mm-hmm. right? Your your brand, your profit, your people, and so on. So how can we help companies build a reputation in a way that becomes a virtuous circle? Many people talk about reputations negatively, which is, you know, pe- they're destroyed by scandals or, you know, like Deep Horizon, a big oil spill or everything else. But actually, if you have a really good reputation, there's a fantastic upside because Customers want to buy from you. They're loyal. Employees want to work from you. Media reports you well. Regulators give you um, their time of day, et cetera. So, so many people focus on the negative aspects of reputation. I wanted to focus on the positive aspects, which is how can you help companies build reputation that actually becomes a virtuous circle? Mm -hmm. And it does with the best companies. They're well-managed. People want to work for them. They have an inspiring purpose. They make good money, et cetera. And that's what inspired me to start Reputation Leaders. Mm, Wow, I love that. Do you know the the, um, basketball coach now um, passed away a few years ago? John Wooden had this great quote that he would say often to his basketball players. He would say, don't worry so much about your reputation. Focus first on your character. That's who you are on the inside. And the more you practice building your character, the stronger your reputation will become. Reputation is the way other people see you. Character is the way you see yourself. I'm curious to get your take on that. Do you see that that um, kind of two-sided uh, component of reputation also? I do. It's interesting that when you look at leadership, leadership uh, in the founding fathers of America was all about character and um, character and competence, uh, compassion, all those C's. And over time, it's become redefined as charisma. Mm-hmm. So we've we've mm-hmm. entered the celebrity era 
where essentially you're deemed a lead leader if you have charisma and and celebrity power. But actually, if you go back to the roots of the founding fathers, actually character matters. And I think ultimately character does matter in any leader. Interestingly, when we asked people back in November, what do you want companies to do most in 2024? The answer was integrity. We just want them to do what they say. Mm -hmm. right? And that that's a key part of, of any leader is the consistency in the character just to continue to do the right thing day after day, which is a lot harder than we right. say. Right. But um, yeah, I mean, people are fed up with, with rightly with companies who do one thing and say one thing and do another. Right. And that disconnect, I think, um, which is ultimately a character issue, um, eventually you get found right. out. So that tees us up really well, Lawrence, for some of the research we want to talk about that you and I agree on many things. Um, one very important one is the idea that business can be a force for good and that we, we can do good in the world based on the decisions on behalf of people and planet. And yet in the world we live in, we see people getting uh, sued and we see their businesses having to close because of their commitment to try to do right by people. And one of those examples I shared with you this morning, I woke up this morning, cover story of Inc. Magazine features an interview with the Fearless Fund founder, a woman named Arian Simone, whose investment fund uh, firm had basically the bottom taken out from under them when their organization was sued by a conservative group uh, for giving grants to historically disadvantaged groups. Now, that, that essentially is the core of their business purpose. We read stories like this and we aren't surprised in some ways that CEOs and leaders are pulling back from their public commitments. But we know that's not that's not a solution for progress. And so I'm really curious what the data is telling us about how CEOs are showing up in this very divisive, complicated time we're in. Well, I think you've hit it on the head. It is a complicated and divisive world we live in, and it's increasingly polarized. And it's in a year where you know, 49% of the world's voting in 64 countries. So we, we can expect emotions to be high and, and polarization to be ripe. So it's not an easy world to navigate. Um, I did some quick research before the show, and we went back over the last four years since George Floyd died. And actually, the conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion have actually increased. They've gone up two and a half times. They're now globally about 2.2 million media mentions. I looked at Google search. The Google search around diversity, equity, and inclusion has gone up. I don't think consumer interest has, has diminished at all. And yes, it's true that during COVID, we focus more on our own health and our own future, but, but the diversity, equity, inclusion is still a very important issue. The key element to that is that it's a lot harder for CEOs to navigate that in a way that doesn't alienate their key audiences. And so, you know, as we were sharing before, the Fortune article in January said that most CEOs recognize that they have to speak out on important issues, but 26% of them have absolutely no plan. Mm -hmm. So the question is then, how do you have a plan to talk about those kinds of issues? And I would say the first part of that starts with listening to the most important people. And they're not necessarily the people on social media. They're the people closest to you. It's your employees. And how you treat your employees is, is one of the number one indicators of how your company is seen. It's as important as your products and services. About listening to your board, listening to your customers. And to be honest, you can't wait for a crisis to find out what your values are. You need to set a North Star and say, this is these are the red lines. This is what we will stand for. And this is what our customers value. And this is what we're going to take a stand on. And actually, most companies do have an ongoing commitment to sustainability, DE&I, and so on, and that hasn't diminished. Yes, they're talking less about it, but I, I, I don't see it diminishing at all. What they don't know is how to talk about it. And we talk about this a lot on the show, actually, right? I'm, I'm a communicator, but I don't say talk first. <laughs> it is so much more important to be in the work, to be doing the work, to be working through and navigating the work. And then, sure, yes, we can talk about the work. but. Um, just doing the work is the most important part. There was a fascinating uh, piece of research we just did in February, and you know it speaks to the wisdom of the crowd, the wisdom of the everyday American, which I just love. We we mm -hmm. asked uh, a thousand Americans the question: How should business CEOs respond to various issues? And this is what they said: CEOs should speak to environmental issues. They should refrain from taking sides on geopolitical issues. 
and they should speak to social issues that relate to their company's values. And I thought the wisdom of that was everyone can talk about the environment, particularly if, you've, if you're doing something and you should be doing something. You should be cautious when taking sides on politically divisive issues, understandably, because they are complex and they're hard to explain. But when it comes to issues that relate to your company's values, you should speak out because mm -hmm. if it relates to your product, your industry, and your values, you are credible. You are the voice that people will listen to and take notice of. So that's where you can speak out. Hmm. I think when companies speak out and it, it speaks to something their product is doing or their category is doing, I think it's incredibly powerful. So right. I'll, I'll give you two examples. So this year, for example, we helped a global uh, oral care brand do a study around the impact of disabilities and oral health, clearly related to their core product. We've helped a global diaper brand do a study around what kind of support do parents of premature children have or get, and why is that lacking? Because one in 10 children worldwide are built, born premature. It's the leading cause of death, and it's not enough just to support the baby in the hospital. What happens when they go home? The parents feel totally at sea, and so we address that. So... We've taken on some issues as directly related to their brand. Coming back to your question on DE&I, I think part of the challenge is, as communicators, we have to relate it back to business issues. So I actually believe that diversity is good for business. Why do I believe that? It's, there's a number of good reasons. One is it, it's, a, it's opening up new markets you don't have. So if you're in financial services, you can, you can, there are underserved markets that are underbanked and et cetera, selling credit cards. You should represent in your employee base the communities and customers that you serve. So that's a very good argument for it. You should uh, realize that if you have the proper mix of people from different backgrounds, and that's not just race or color, but diverse backgrounds, you actually end up with different perspectives that end up with better results and better decision making. That's, that's really well proven. But the challenge is that we rush into the emotional side of it and we don't actually say, you know what, there's a very good reason why we're doing this. Mm. It's just good for business because we're making sure that our employees reflect the customers we serve and that we're making the best decisions for our business. And when you put things in that terms, then you speak with the right to say, there's a good reason for doing this. There's a good rationale right. for this. Right. That was a wonderful breakdown. And I'm going to make sure that that gets uh, broken down right in the show notes, because I think that is a question that folks ask so much. How do I navigate this time in DEI? Do I need to turn off these programs or do I need to completely reimagine them? And to your point, no, not at all. But perhaps in some cases, what we've seen is organizations have uh, communicated in a way that forgets, in fact, why they're doing it. They're promoting the idea of it so much rather than being really focused on the, the root possibility of that work. Yes, I think there is a case for, for equity and justice that people mm -hmm. get more upset about the way things are done often than what is done. So right. part of the problem is that, that DE&I is often seen as favoritism or right. a pet project or something that only applies to some people or not in others. So it's really important in all these cases that, that it's very clean clear to be transparent and seen to be a fair process right. right there's a rationale for it the the rules are open you're clear and communicated why decisions were made why a certain person was promoted and why they weren't promoted etc people right. may not like it but at least it's clear and consistent and you communicated the why behind the what so what i'm hearing you say and i'm i'm seeing this in some other research we had talked about earlier is dei remains a priority now it may not be the top priority um we see ai stepping into that seat but i heard you actually read your words not too long ago in carol's annual purpose collaborative article talking about esg and esg is interesting that not too long ago it was a top priority now it's fallen down to less than 10%. See that as their top priority. And you said something so powerful. You said every major public company in 2024 should expect to have to measure and report on carbon footprint and emissions progress. Let's talk more about that. Is, is it possible? Is, are we going in that direction? Well, possible. I think it's a regulatory necessity. So starting in Europe, for example, 2024 will be the first year that the 
corporate European standards of sustainability will be mandatory for every publicly listed company to report. It's it's not it's not a choice. Um, the SEC is moving in a similar direction. Um, but what's encouraging to me um, is I went back to an organization called GRI, which is the Global Reporting Initiative. And back in 2011, over a decade ago, only one in five members of the S&P 500 companies were actually reporting on sustainability or corporate responsibility. Hmm. Today, 98% are. Right? It's Every company's doing it. And half of the Russell 1000 are doing it. So the question is not, do you report on sustainability? The question is how and to what standards. And mm. the, the rise of different standards like SASB and GRI is making it easier to at least say, well, at least now there's some co- the, we're coalescing around what those standards of reporting should be. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the answer is yes, if you're not on that program, you should be, and you should make yourself familiar with that. And there's some wonderful resources which you can post on your show um, afterwards. The more interesting thing about ESG is, again, we put it to the vote. In November last year, we asked Americans, so if a company's doing the right thing, whether it's in the social environment, whether it's whether it's governance or whether it's um, in the E, S or G, how would you vote? What's most important? And for the second year running, we heard the same thing. It's people before planet. And in a world where there's a lot of need and there's a lot of humanitarian crisis and there's a lot of conflict, people are coming back to, you know what? We do need to put people first. It's actually the S and the E, S and G that's the fastest rising part of that. And that comes down to basics. It comes down to treating your employees well. Mm. It comes down to uh, how you treat your customers in terms of the service you give them. Um, It comes down to, to your point, the integrity of how you act. It comes down to how you serve your community. So that on the S side is actually very, very fruitful because there's a lot that companies are doing, but they're not communicating about. On the environment side, I think the balance is tipped now where it's almost a must do. It's it's not even it's such a housekeeping issue that you need to be not only doing something, you need to be showing that you're doing something. And the biggest frustration that people are having is that a lot of companies have set these wonderful 2030 or 2050 goals around net zero, but they're not talking about what they're going to do this year, next year, and the year afterwards. And it's this gap between short and medium term goals and long term goals that where the credibility gap is. And that's mm what I was re- really referring to in that article, you actually mm. need to give people some short-term actions that you're taking to really show them that you're making progress. But there was one more insight which I found fascinating, and that was we asked consumers what companies should do on the environment, and they don't expect business to solve the planet problems. They don't expect them to solve climate change. That's a big you know, global government citizen deal. What they do expect is when they say that they're going to make a commitment, that they follow up on it. Mm. And so my aha moment was that, was make smaller, more concrete promises about the environment that directly relate to your product, to your community, to your people. Make it concrete, make it tangible, make it smaller and deliver on that and again get the credibility. You're not expected to solve the world. You are expected to make sure that your product does no harm, that you're not polluting, that you've addressed the plastics issue, that you're recycling as much as you can. Just like take care of your own house, basically, right. is what they were saying. And that, that makes eminent sense because right. no one's thinking about 2030. They're thinking about 2024. What are you doing are now? Right now, right. That is such an important, important insight. Make smaller, concrete promises and deliver on them. And some of the stories you shared earlier, and I am sure many of the the organizations you work with now, I'm curious if there's any other stories of companies who do that well, who say they're going to do something and they take it bit by bit and they report out on it along the way. Do you see someone who's who's doing that well? The standouts for me are people like Patagonia, who is just core to their business and the clothing, the product that they do. Um, uh, I think companies like... Um, PepsiCo are doing it well. I think Unilever is doing it well. I think Nestle is doing it well. Some of the big multinational companies are are genuinely trying to make efforts in that area for all the right reasons, and not just about the things that we would think about, which mm. is you know pollution and climate change, but actually around things like food security or health and well being or mental health and other things. So taking a broader definition of societal benefit 
and and focusing on what difference can we make. So yes, I think there are quite a number of companies that are that are that are doing it and doing it well, but they're doing it right. thoughtfully relative to well, what contribution does our category make? Right. Bit by bit, day by day, chipping away at the big vision, right? Versus focusing too big on the big bold goal. We are already coming to the end of this show, Lawrence. It went really fast. So I want to give you a, a minute first uh, or more on is there anything we didn't get to? Any of the research that you've been uh, having your hands in recently that we should bring into the conversation? We asked in um, the end of last year, what social actions do U.S. organizations be doing more of in 2024? 43% said, do what you promise. 36% said, improve your own employees' well-being and mental health. And 35% said, pay your taxes. But the second one's quite interesting which is all about actually focusing back on well-being and mental health. And I do think that is an increasing trend and one that companies are, are paying more attention to naturally because people are your greatest resource. And mental health is a huge issue. It's a huge issue here in the UK where I'm based. and it's, it's a big issue everywhere in the Western world, but one that we can't ignore. And as this world gets more stressful and divisive, Companies are a place that people will look for for support and advice and counsel, and it should be a safe and secure place and a, and a good place to work. Including reputation leaders. I saw your post not too long ago about health for all and um, speaking about the World Health Organization and some of the work that you all do there at Reputation Leaders. We love doing thought leadership that helps companies take on big issues and mm -hmm. actually make a difference and to talk about it. And to lead, really, because this is all about leadership. It's about not just being part of the pack. It's about positioning yourself as some as a company that is a leader and has something to say, and then people want to work for you. The biggest right. benefit of purpose is very simple. The younger generation want meaningful work for companies that are that are doing good, mm. and they will they will they will sacrifice a lot of things to work for companies like that. You've shared so much wisdom with us today. And I said at the top, your superpower is seeing things that others don't as you make sense of the data. So as we wrap up, Lawrence, I'm curious if there's something that's giving you hope or optimism in the data or otherwise that you want to share as our closing thought. It's easy to give the next generation a bad rap, but I actually think that the generation that's coming, that particularly the Gen Z, the Gen Alpha, are probably the most entrepreneurial generation we've ever seen. They're certainly the most digital. They're also rightfully the most concerned about climate change. And so while the immediate risks to the world tend to be geopolitical, the longer term risks are climate change. And the fact that young people are thinking about that mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're making life choices and employment choices around that, I think is a very positive thing. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this time and the insights today and um, for giving us a lot of stuff to think about. Thank you. Oh my goodness, so many good things that are coming out of that conversation with Lawrence today, from his insights, the wisdom of the crowd, as he said, to really understanding that the best way to make a long-term meaningful impact is actually to start with the smaller, concrete promises and then see them through. There's going to be so many links that we share with you after the show. You can head over to the website and uh, pull them up on the show notes. But just remember this, as he shared with us, that there is always, every day, something you can do in service of purpose, moving the work forward, but don't forget who matters most, people. Thanks again for listening today. We'll see you next time on the Mission Forward Podcast. And that brings us to the end of another episode of Mission Forward. If you like what you heard today, I hope you'll stop right now and give this show a five-star rating wherever you are listening to this podcast. Maybe even forward it to a friend who you think would enjoy today's conversation. And of course, check out the show notes for all of the links referenced in today's show. Mission Forward is produced with the support and wisdom of Pete Wright and the True Story production team, as well as the wonderful Sadie Lockhart of Mission Partners. You can learn more about our work over at missionforward.us. And of course, reach out to me anytime at carry at mission.partners. 
Thanks for tuning in today, friend, and I'll see you next time.